understand the data and take action on it. And what's interesting is that this puts us in a sweet spot where we see a lot of our customers driving innovation this way and across, uh, across industry. So in a nutshell, if you have only two things to remember about TIPCO, we're all about connecting businesses to that data and then helping them understand. This is something that we uh, apply ourselves to, to our business. This is how we innovate on the marketing side, we improve our operations. And our, our role, our mission is really to empower businesses, especially uh, with a digital business uh, transformation with those uh, two things. And I think that's really, uh, that these is, this is what we have in common with the Hive, the fact of just using data to drive innovation, find new models, uh, and, and just uh, try them. That's what we uh, empower our customers to, uh, to do. And that's why we're quite honored to have all of you here uh, and the Hive having this, uh, this meetup. So I don't want to take too much time. We'll have, uh, if you're interested about what Tipo does, want to know more, and I know you're interested in innovation, just wanted to say a few words about a conference that we're having in a month from now in Las Vegas called Tipo Now, in uh, which we're going to present a lot of those technologies, and most importantly, a lot of our customers are going to explain uh, what they do. There's going to be a raffle at the end of this session where we'll be offering five uh, tickets for this uh, this conference. It's going to take place May 17th to 19th in, uh, in Las Vegas. And there's also going to be a raffle to win, win one Polaroid Cube uh, camera. So that was just an introduction. Once again, we're very honored to have you here. And uh, we're just uh, looking forward to be inspired. So thank you very much. So thank you again and good evening everyone and welcome to the Hive Team Tank. For those of you who are tweeting tonight, please just use our um, Twitter handle, Hive Data. Uh, the Hive Team Tank is a forum for thought leadership. We focus on entrepreneurship and all things data. And this one special, it's very special for me. Uh, and uh, you'll learn more why later. So. Uh, these are just few speakers that were on the Hive stage in the past. In our community, we have over 8,000 data-driven innovators. These are data scientists, uh, developers, entrepreneurs, corporate users. Since our inceptions, we um, organized over 150 events with 200 speakers. And we'd like to thank to all of you who were with us in the past and to all of you who are here with us for the first time. Upcoming event is in May. Uh, our speaker will be Professor Bernie Roth, uh, founder of Stanford's D School. So if interested, uh, please just sign up on our meetup page, the High Think Tank, through the link that you registered for this event, and uh, hope to see you there. More about our event on our website and uh, on our meetup page, the Hive Think Tank. Without them, with our sponsors and partners, many of our events wouldn't have happened. So we'd like to thank to all of them as well. All the Hive Think Tank events are brought to you by the Hive, what the Hive is, more from founder and managing partner of the Hive, T.M. Ravi. Thank you, Sasha. So, um, uh, one um, proof point of, of our co-creation studio is the speaker that you're going to hear, Yuri Leskovic. So, together with, with Yuri and a colleague of his, Lance, we started a company called Kose that Pinterest uh, ended up buying. And he'll talk more about what they're doing at, uh, at Pinterest. So the Hive is, is, a, is a venture fund, but it is unique in the sense that um, we, we are a high touch model. We work very closely with entrepreneurs to help them create companies, and we are very focused. Uh, everything we do is related to AI, machine learning, uh, and, and various data related techniques. Um, broadly focused across um, applications across IoT, online, and enterprise, and, and a bunch of different sort of areas that, that you can see here. Uh, we are hiring, and so Neva is, uh, uh, and I, I see some people here from Neva. Neva is a 
is a cognitive agent uh, that helps kind of automate uh, some front office functions like service and, and support. So if you're interested, we'd love to talk to you. Um, Sensify is an IoT security company that is leveraging blockchain. And, and if you think about the problem in, in IoT, you have, uh, as if, you, if you believe John Chambers, 50 billion devices that vary widely in terms of complexity, cost, heterogene, and are very heterogeneous. And so securing kind of the application to device access and the data uh, life cycle uh, from that device is, is one of the things these guys are addressing. Um, if, uh, join us at the conversation today. Use the hashtag HiveData. And so with that, I'd like to introduce my good friend, Yure Leskovec. Yure is uh, the chief scientist, uh, I think, of Pinterest. And he's a faculty member uh, focused on machine learning, modeling, and so forth in the computer science department. Uh, Yure got his uh, PhD from CMU. And so with that, I hand it over to Yure. Great. Um, I'm very happy uh, to be here uh, with you. Um, so, as, as Ravi said, uh, my story is kind of I'm, a, I'm an academic who's now on loan to industry, and uh, my talk today will will be about uh, you know I've been now working uh, with Pinterest for a, for a year and a half. Um, I, I've, I, I know how we do machine learning in academia, but I'm also kind of surprised and I learn every day how machine learning is, is, done, is done in industry. And uh, what I want to do with this uh, talk today is I want to walk you through about some of the lessons learned about how do we build machine learning systems, how do we deploy them, how do we train them, and how do we kind of do these industrial applications uh, of machine learning. So my talk kind of won't be technical and I won't be talking about one particular problem, but rather I want to give some lessons learned about how machine learning is used at Pinterest and, and how kind of how are best practices that we are using in order to build, deploy, maintain uh, machine learning solutions. Okay? Um, before I start, I want to give kind of a brief introduction about what Pinterest is, how it works, and how to think about it, so that it will be clearer when, where and what kind of machine learning problems we have. Right? So, what the, mo the, the most important bit is that machine learning, uh, sorry, Pinterest is not, a, is not a social network. Right? You should really think of Pinterest as a visual bookmarking or a content discovery service. Right? And on Pinterest, there are two types of objects. I'll give you examples later. There are pins that belong to collections. Collections are called boards. Right? And users kind of collect, go all over the web to collect these pins and organize them um, into boards. Uh, and once a pin, once an object is inside Pinterest, when it's, when it's a pin, other users can discover it. And interesting kind of uh, evolution of that content starts to happen. So this is an example of a pin. A pin is nothing else than a visual bookmark, if you think about it. It has an image, and it has a pointer, a URL, to the, to the target web page somewhere on the web. Of course, internally at Pinterest, we know much more about it. So for example, sometimes we would go and actually parse and crawl the target web page to extract the recipe for this particular healthy, um, you know, good-looking dish. Um, we would do things like that, right? We also allow users to curate or annotate these objects, um, pins, uh, with various kinds of annotations. We know what uh, boards these um, uh, pins belong to. We also crawl the target web page to understand where that puts, uh, where that points on the web. And of course, we know kind of how people interact with this uh, given object. But kind of the, the most important thing is it's a pin with an image and a target link plus some side information. That, that, this is kind of the fundamental object of Pinterest. The, and what users of Pinterest do is wh whatever, wherever on the web they are, they can basically go and save these pins onto the Pinterest platform. So, so whatever interesting people find on the web, they save it into Pinterest. Which means that Pinterest is this like treasure of content that is heavily human curated and, and things in there are really, really good. And then the idea is that as people make these bookmarks, they actually go do something about them. So 
usage of Pinterest is really kind of people really plan their future using it. So it's all about people expecting uh, children, people uh, getting married, trying to get a new haircut, deciding where to go for a trip, uh, what kind of shoes to buy, um, things like that, right? What to cook, um, what are the funny jokes, what movies have they seen, what whiskeys they like to drink, things like that, right? So it's all about finding these objects on the web and cura curating them for, for themselves so that they can kind of retrieve and, and, and do something with them later, right? So in this respect, Pinterest is a content discovery engine. And just to give an example, if I have a pin about, or think of it the following. Somewhere on the web, I find a bag I like, I, I can save it and create a pin out of it, and then a, a, this bag will belong to a board that I create. And here I say, you know, these are the bags I like. Maybe I'm just about to buy a good leather bag, and I go on the web and I start, you know, I start collecting, pinning, bags that are of my style that I like, right? So ra rather than having a browser with 47 tabs open and getting lost in them, I can create a board and start collecting the bags I like, for example, right? So really, a good way to think about Pinterest is to think about it as a bipartite graph, right? As a graph of objects. These are uh, images plus links to the target websites, and these objects belong to boards. And boards are just collections of thematically coherent uh, uh, objects, right? So somebody can say, um, you know, create a, creates a board want to get, and now pins certain objects to it. While somebody might, might create a board of called uh, leather laptop bag and pin a couple of laptop bags uh, to that board, right? And these are, these are real examples, but really this is all pin, kind of, this is what Pinterest is, right? So at the end, we have around 30 billion of these pins that humans manually saved off the web, and they, they organize these pins in more than 750 or 800 million boards, right? Boards are the collections of pins. And now, me as a user, I can start go and explore this bipartite graph and see what are other related things and so on and so forth, right? And, and um, another kind of important difference with this is that now that I, we have these objects and uh, belonging to collections, the, the content life cycle at Pinterest is very interesting because good content survives for, for years, right? So it's not like in social network where a post goes by and it's forgotten forever. Here, these objects belong to boards and allow you to kind of to explore and identify things you like. So when Pinterest works really well is when people have an have, kind of have a use case, want to fi find something, want to get an idea, how to, I don't know, decorate a house, remodel the kitchen, things like that, right? Then you go on Pinterest, say kitchen, and you, you kind of get good ideas what, what you want to do. And you can save and curate those things, right? And this way kind of the, the as new users join, they either contribute new pins or they start creating boards. And this way, this bipartite graph gets bigger and bigger and richer and richer. So that's kind of what Pinterest is. And of course, if it is a content discovery platform, then there is a bunch of problems where, where we, we can use machine learning to make, uh, to make recommendations. So really, pin, um, at Pinterest, we use machine learning all over the place, and it's really kind of at the core of the product. There is a lot we do in terms of personalizations, in terms of recommendations uh, to users, either in terms of what pins they might like, what are the interests they might have, what boards they may want to follow, what other users they may they want to follow. We do a lot around notification, you know, what email to send to what person at what time so that we bring them back. And this is kind of a big part of um, both how we get our users back and how Actually, some users use Pinterest through the emails they receive, which is kind of funny, but there is a population of that. Of course, there is a lot of work in ads and monetization, uh, kind of very, very, uh, very standard things about trying to insert uh, an ad, which in our case is just a pin, so kind of ads fit supernaturally into the product, but still you want to decide what ad, what will be the click-through rate, uh, what action are going to, users are going to do on that, and so on. Um, we also want to enrich, I was showing you the bipartite graph of, you, of pins to boards. We want to enrich that graph by actually learning relationships between pins. And I'll talk about this uh, a bit. And of course, the, the central way how users consume Pinterest is what, through what we call home feed. 
which is kind of the central, the central screen when you log in, where we show you examples of pins and it's this kind of never-ending thing that you can keep scrolling and things you like you can save into boards, right? So the question is, how do we generate your home feed and what pins do we put there, right? These are kind of examples of, of what we do. So what I want to do first to kind of to motivate my talk, I want to give you some examples of machine learning projects I've been involved um, uh, at Pinterest. So um, here's the, here, and uh, what I will do is I'll tell you what the, what the problem is, and I'll tell you why it's hard, but I won't yet tell you how to solve it. And then for the se last part of the talk, I'll tell you about some, some ways how to solve these problems, okay? So here's kind of a classical cold start problem. Um, we, 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 the problem is that when a new user comes, they just signed in, you have to somehow ask them what do they like so that you can provide them some content. Otherwise, the home feed is empty. Right? So how do we do that? Right? The way Pinterest does this is that the user signs in, this is the first time you know, a new account is created, and we offer them a way to, for, us, for, for them to tell us what are they interested in. Right? So you know, maybe it's technology, maybe it's travel, design, photography, and so on and so forth. Right? And after they selected a few of these, we can then go and generate the, the home feed. Right? If the person here would say, I'm interested in fitness, we would start putting some fitness pins in. Or if they say, I'm interested in food, we put them a food pin in there, and so on. Right? So this is kind of part of the new user uh, flow that allows, that allows us to construct this very, very quickly. And of course, kind of the question uh, very quickly is, what should we put here? Right? Should, if this is a woman, should we put men's apparel up here? Probably not. Okay. So the question is, what do we show to the user the first time they, they, they sign in? Right? And now, why is this a hard problem? Um, the first hard problem is that the user, user just joined the product. They have no clue what Pinterest is. And now I'm asking them, you know, are you interested in technology? Kind of, they don't know what technology is for Pinterest. Or if you think about it, they are interested in recipes, right? So if, uh, I don't know, if an Asian person comes, their recipes will be different than for me, who's, you know, I'm coming from Europe, so we like, I don't know, sausages and potatoes or something, right? <laughs> so things like that, right? So how do you solve that problem? The second problem is that when, if I want to build this kind of recommender system, um, I have thousands of these interests from which I can recommend, right? I, can, I have thousands of these, of these items that I could show to the user. And the question is, which ones do I even score, right? Which one, which one do I even examine for a given user? Because this has to run in real time, right? I, I see the user just signed in, and I have maybe tenth of a second, maybe 200 milliseconds to make my recommendations. I cannot, you know, spawn off a Hadoop job and, and do some magic. I, I have to do it immediately. And another interesting thing that comes here is really kind of my, what's my objective, right? My objective could be to get the user follow as many of these as possible. It would be a fair objective, but it wouldn't be kind of the objective you really want. What we want, for example, is that we want a, a new user to, to be active 28 days later. Right? So I don't care how many of things they select here, I couldn't care less. What I want is that they are on the site 28 days later. Right? So how do I now build a recommender system that will optimize this metric? Right? I get to see what people do here, but at the end, I don't care what, the, what they select. I care whether they'll be on the site 28 days later. Right? So kind of the point is that many times the metric you really want to move and what you can optimize for can be very different things. Okay? Um, and to get this one right, it took us seven iterations of experiments before we figured it out. And I'll tell you how we figured it out. Okay? So that's one. Um, now that the user log signed in and selected these topics, now we have to generate the, the home feed, right? So how do we generate an engaging home feed? So as I said before, home feed is basically, you can think of it as an endless stream that, of pins that we recommend to the user. And the way we solve this is that we have several different sources for the home feed to be generated, right? You can follow users, so we will show you the pins from other users. We, we have a, a recommender engine that will look at what were your actions on the site and try to recommend you pins. And at the beginning, right, I told you that we recommend these interests to people. So actually each of these interests or topics has its own flow of pins that also kind of um, uh, provides sources of candidates for the, for, the, for the home feed. 
right? But now the, the thing is that as we have these different content sources, we have to rank and blend uh, all these pins together to produce the home feed. So the question here is, how do you do this, right? Like, for example, I might be following um, my friend, but you know, I like I like their, their interest in in baking, but I don't like their interest in fashion. So you know, how do we learn that that from that person we should only send me the the baking pins, but no fashion pins or something? Okay. Um, so what are important problems here? The first problem is how do we even generate the candidate pins that we may want to show to a given user? Then the, the next question is how do we score and rank those pins, right? We want to somehow score and rank them based on the relevancy. Another thing is we need to decide how much of the pins from each of these different sources to, to bring together, to produce, to give it to the, to the user. And the, the final thing that kind of is the biggest problem is that we have to do this for tens of millions of users per day. So we are serving billions of these pins per day. Right? So really, the infrastructure really has to scale. Right? Because all these pins in the home feed, they are basically recommended, scored, ordered by relevancy, by diversity, things like that. Um, and I, I could actually show you, yes, I have it here. So this is uh, one of our engineers who's interested in doors. Uh, right? Um, and uh, right when they created the account, they said, I really like doors. So if you are a doors fanatic, um, you can you can enjoy different pictures of doors, right? But this engineer, this is not the only um, how to say the only interest of, of his or hers. Uh, they they like it. They like different things. So what I'm trying to show here is um, if we just rank the pins by the time they were created, things are very kind of monotonic, right? Non-diverse. If we actually, when we apply our machine learning ranking model, there is still some pictures of uh, of doors. But there are other things um, like science fiction books and things like that that uh, that, that this given uh, engineer likes. So you see kind of a big difference between just sorting by time versus sorting by or using machine learning to sort by diversity and trying to say what are out of all these candidate pins, what are the things that are most relevant to our uh, given user. Okay? So this is another example of where we use uh, machine learning. Another place where we, we use machine learning a lot is to try to allow people to, to explore Pinterest by clicking through it. And the way we allow the people to do this is the following. Really what we want to do is we want to create a network of how pins relate and fit together. Right? So we want to kind of discover relationships between pins. And one way to think about relationships is that I have a pin and I want to understand how it relates to other pins. And two basic types of relationships we can think about are what we call substitutes, right? That one bag can be substituted for another. Kind of these are two, if you think about them, like competing products. But then I can also have complementary relationship, right? A stylish bag goes well together with stylish glasses. And these are just not any kind of sunglasses. They're kind of men's sunglasses, right? So this would be the complementary pins in this respect, right? And uh, we have a system that allows us to do and learn these kinds of relationships. And the way we expose this in the product is that for every pin, we show people a set of related pins or a set of substitute pins, right? So that, you know, a sunset with a kayak and a river, here's another sunset with a kayak and a river, right? And, you know, another kayak, maybe no sunset, a lake, sunset, and things like that, right? So we machine generate these pins for this given pin. Now, what a, why is this a challenge? One challenge is that we have billions of these pins. So kind of at the system level issues, uh, they, are, they are huge, right? So for every pin, you want to find a set of related pins. If you want to use some kind of ground truth mach machine learning based method to rank these guys here, then quickly you start asking, you know, what is a good notion of an engagement for a user, right? Are there clicks? We know from kind of the search engine literature that people like to click on things on top and things at the bottom are never clicked. So the question becomes, how do you even create ground truth labels out of such uh, bias data? And then, as, as I will talk more later, you always have this problem that 
that you want to have metrics that are good in your offline evaluation. When you are building the model, you want to be able to measure how good it is, not just you know build something and deploy it and see whether it works, right? So you want kind of good offline metrics. And for this, it's not clear what's a good offline metric. One option should be to actually go hire humans to tell you, you know, does this substitute that versus does this substitute that, right? But again, that's expensive and slow, and we don't have time to do all that. Okay. So moving on across the um, the um, the project, uh, here's kind of one that is simple at the surface but becomes very interesting. So the question here is: I said I told you before that the user comes and selects what they are interested in. Now for every of these interests, I want to decide what pins should belong to that interest. So I can give them like an endless flow of pins. So this means, you know, to what interest does a given pin belong to? So what I want to do is I want to look at the pin and decide, is this about women's fashion, is it about food and drink, or is it about geek, right? And I would, in some sense, like to classify this pin into one of the, one of the categories or one of the classes, OK? So what I want to do is I want to build a black box that you know, will take a look at the pin and will decide which, which of these um, interests or topics should it belong to. Um, and the simple way to think about this is that this is you know, maybe 1,000, 5,000, 10,000 class classification problem, right? So very simple from, from stating the problem. Uh, solving it is, is very hard. Um, here are some reasons why this is hard, right? So first is that some of these topics, some of these interests are very general, and some are very specific, right? So food is a very general um, uh, interest, but you know, lower back gray and white tattoos um, is, is a very specific topic, right? So um, another important thing is that this, these topics have huge imbalance in sizes, right? So for example, food is one of the most popular categories or topics on Pinterest, and it's like, I think it's around 10% of all pins or even more are about food. And then you have these very small things that are 0.001% of the data, because they are these very, you know, like Eastern European science fiction book colors. Uh, there is tons of those. But still, they are a very small fraction of data. So how do you detect those? Um, and because you kind of don't know what, what of these topics are big and small, um, the kind of you don't know the this sizes of, uh, uh, of these interests in the wild, you kind of tend to over-predict rare topics and under-predict common ones. And the question is, how do you deal with that? And then what becomes interesting here is, how do you scale this to thousands of classifiers, many different languages, how do you maintain this, and so on. So I'll touch upon this um, as well, OK? So now I kind of wanted to give you the overview of what are all the problems, or some of the problems, uh, that where, where we can use machine learning. And what I want to do now is, rather than talk about individual solutions, I want to make a step back and start kind of telling about some lessons we learned while building these systems that I just talked about, OK? So, the, the first problem we, we kind of, or the first uh, way to think about this is that all these all very different machine learning applications, all these systems kind of at the end have a very similar workflow, right? In some sense that you, you have to first generate the candidates, right? You have one billion pins, you cannot score all of them, right? You cannot apply your machine learning algorithm to all of them, especially if you have to do in, in, run things in real time. So the question is, how do you generate kind of a small set of candidates which you will then reorder, personalize, things like that, right? So the question then is, how do we do this scoring or ranking of the candidates? Um, many, many times you have many different ways where, where the, to generate those candidates. So how do you kind of combine these different candidate generation methods into something that then you can, you can score and present to the user? And of course, kind of the big problem becomes that determines the design of your system is really about how are you going to serve this, right? How will this be used, right? Not just what's the type of the object that you are scoring, but also what is the requirement in terms of how fresh the content needs to be? How fast do I need to make recommendations? How many recommendations do I expect to make, okay? So what are some challenges, right? With the difference in academia, where usually the data set is given to us and labels are given to us, here we have none of that, of that, right? We never have a data set. We always have to create it, right? So big questions become, you know, which users should I use? What time period? What kind of activities? 
what language, things like that. And all those choices are kind of arbitrary at the end of the day, right? Then the other problem is if I want to build supervised machine learning methods, kind of I never really have labels. Uh, you know, maybe I have labels if I do click prediction, but right there, sure, I see whether a person clicked. But if I want to do anything that's a bit more higher level, any kind of recommender system that goes beyond maximizing clicks, things become very complicated, right? So I need to start thinking, what is a good signal for a positive and for a negative label, right? Can kind of no label, no action be considered a negative label? How do I deal with that? And then, as I mentioned, deployment is impro important in terms of, you know, I have to serve these things at scale. How, how do I generate, store, uh, query, the, query the features? Where do, how do I score the recommendations? Where, where do I need to output those, those recommendations? They get shown to the user. What are the latency requirements? Things like that, okay? So um, here are the three things I think are important when building these kinds of systems. Right? So the first one is you kind of really have to very, very hardly think about your data. Like you, you generate the data, so what will your data be? You, the other thing you learn is that more is always better. Okay? So maybe not in everything in life more is better, but in, in, with data, more is always better. Right? So, so in some sense, what this means is that but you cannot be just greedy and say, I'll wait half a year and I'll get everything. Right? You cannot. So kind of the point is, you need to kind of to do, try to do as much as you can, get as much as you can, but be also kind of as fast, as fast and as lean as possible, because you will fail many times, right? So balancing doing a lot, but doing it quickly is kind of a, a, an important uh, part. And then the last part that, that is also important is think, really thinking hard about evaluation. How do you measure success? of your system. And when I say measure success, I don't only mean measure success through an A-B test. That is fine, but usually A-B test takes weeks before you get something out. But you want to iterate on, a, you know, on an hourly basis. So how can you measure your success offline? Meaning some offline metrics that will, be, that will correlate well with your online metrics. Okay? So those are three things. So now I want to go through each one of those talk more about them, and give you some examples of you know, things, things that, that we learn on the way. Right? So the first thing is kind of really knowing your data. And, and, and in some sense, what this means is there is no objective way when you create a data set. Right? It's all kind of God-driven. And the data set creation is usually the first step, and it's kind of the most important step. Because the way you will create your data set that will determine how good your offline metrics are, uh, what are the biases in the data, things like that, right? So it's an immensely important step, but it's also very, very hard to do. Another thing is that kind of creating the data set is not what you want. What you want to do is deploy the model in production, right? So really thinking about how do you create a data set and how that relates to production becomes very, uh, very important. So one of, some of the lessons are from here are that it's very important to, to build tools that allow you to look at the data, that allow you to debug the data, that allow you to debug the models, and to be able to do iterations very, very quickly. Um, and of course, kind of the important step is to try to build as much intuition about the domain you are trying to model um, as possible. So why is, this, why is this important, right? This is important because, as I was saying, there are many subtleties in how we generate the data, right? Um, you know, how do we sample the users? What characteristics uh, of the data we want to capture? How do those characteristics change over time? Um, you know, uh, also, not just the, the characteristics of the data, but also the features may change over time. And kind of, we, we make, many times we make choices based on some computational constraints. For example, you know, when you choose the ratio of positive to negative examples, because you just have too many negative examples. So how do you kind of de deal that? You know, what should the data set size be? That's always a question. Usually we take as much as we can, but then our training gets too slow. So again, that is kind of a hard problem. And what turns out is that varying these things kind of has a big impact on, on the final success. In, and it has much more impact than, you know, deciding should I use this machine learning algorithm or not? Should I, you know, use this particular regularization factor? You know, should I use a kernel version, kernelized version method? Kind of things don't matter. This, this is really kind of very, very important part. Kind of the first order problem is how do you generate um, your data? So kind of what we learn is that it's more important to examine, you know, 
very test all these differences than, for example, go and tweak the learning algorithm you are using at the end. So, so that's kind of one, one lesson is that data generation is, is kind of super important step. Another thing that quickly becomes is, I mentioned before, is I don't care about generating the data. I want my model to work when I deploy it, right? So really, what this means is that when you put things in production, everything kind of goes exactly differently what you have hoped for, kind of, right? So what I mean is, you really need to think about, is it the data set that I created, does that match my production, what will happen in production? And right, will the way the model will be used in production, does that match the way I train the model? Does it match how I evaluate the model? Right? These things are super important, right? So it's very important to be able to deal with, for example, missing data, right? When we generate the data, we usually say, oh, I'll only take people who have at least five clicks, right? But then when, when the thing is in production, you have people that haven't clicked anything. Right? Or you only say, I'll only take objects that have enough features. In reality, not all objects have enough features. Right? So these kinds of things can really uh, trip you over. So it's important to think about how do I deal with missing data, how do I deal with mal malformed data, spam type of data, um, and, and all these systems that we deploy at the end has to, have to work in these real, real life scenarios. Right? And you know, things get even worse because the upstream services may, may fall, may go down, but the system should still be able to provide some reasonable responses, right? So kind of defining fallback behaviors when something doesn't go the way you hope is very important because no, no answer or failure is kind of, you cannot, you cannot affo afford that, right? And then thinking about this offline and online consistency is very important. So kind of, what do I mean by that is that the offline data that you use to train the model kind of has to match what will, how will you run your uh, uh, systems online. And I'll give you an example in, in a slide, right? And then we actually invest quite heavily in terms of monitoring, measurement, deployment, and kind of debugging of the system. And when I say debugging, I don't mean software debugging, kind of that we would have bugs in the software. Bugs are in the data. Right? So it's kind of debugging your model, debugging, debugging your learning system. Right? Um, why? Um, let, me, let me show you um, uh, how, uh, uh, what, what, do I mean, what do I mean by that. Right? So before I was telling you about this problem where a pin comes and I have to put it in one of the buckets, one of the topics. Right? How, how do I go do that? Right? What I can do is, for example, I can say I have currently some system that for each of these topics already gives me some pins. Imagine 